Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. And today, as I'm sure you figured out, I'm going to be sharing some tips and words of advice with you on how to score a five on the AP Spanish Language and Culture exam and why it really isn't as daunting a task as it may seem. Um, even if, like me, you're not a native speaker of Spanish. After all, if I can do it, you most certainly can do it too. And also, I anticipate this video being pretty long since I tend, say, excuse me, tend to ramble like there's no tomorrow and stutter like I just did. So I will leave some timestamps in the description if you there are are certain skills or is a certain skill you want to review in particular. Um, so yeah. So just for some background, I um, took this exam this past year, so 2020, and I earned a five. So I feel like I have a good idea of how to score well on the exam, um, though it. Also must be noted that I will still try to go through um, and give you tips on how to prepare for the entire exam, not just the condensed COVID 2020 style uh, AP exam, which was just speaking. It was shortened for um, because of COVID and quarantine and everything. But um, I'll be trying to cover everything that will hopefully be covered on future exams. Um, so yeah, let's just get right into it. So I'll start by giving you guys some tips for the writing portion of the exam. So my first word of advice would be to make a vocab list, but choose the words that you're gonna include on the vocab list like appropriately and wisely. For example, don't make a vocab list on something like animals because you're not gonna need to know like camel or kangaroo or lobster for the AP exam. Like um, most of those are cognates anyway, but that's not the point. Um, Obviously, when I say creating a vocab list, I mean creating a vocab list with words that are going to be relevant for the writing exam. And you're like, obviously, and I know that sounds super vague, but I'll explain what I mean. For instance, make sure you know some good transition words. I would make sure you can make like a quizlet or flashcards on transition words, whatever works for you. So for instance, some transition words that I like to use include sin embargo, además, adicionalmente, por eso, aunque, entonces, Así que, a mi parecer, and this is just kind of a general thing you could say, like, otro punto que apoya esto, lo que dije antes, es blah blah blah. So, like, another point that supports what I was talking about earlier is whatever. So, entienden? So, obviously, the transitions you could use are not limited to these phrases, but these are just ones that I find that I often include in my writing. So, some other good vocab words to include in your um, studying would be um, sophisticated verbs or nouns too that'll help with your writing because if you're able to use complex vocabulary your AP reader is gonna be a lot more impressed I would say so instead of saying like and I'm sure you've heard this about like in English too like instead of saying like to show you could say like implicate or reveal or represent like you could do the same thing in Spanish so instead of saying like mostrar you could say implicar you could say representar or uh, revelar um, or, I don't know, um, arrojar luz. Sorry, I said that really poorly, but um, what else? Demostrar, experimentar, false cognate alert, watch out for that one. Um, I'll get into that later, but uh, someterse, exponer, just like some really fancy verbs that you can use for the AP exam. So like, just kind of make a vocab list of some sophisticated words and verbs that you could use. I just kind of listed some random ones that I like to use in my writing. They just kind of came to my mind right away, but yeah, just, I would just make a vocab list and just kind of familiarize yourself with um, some words that you could use. So take this opportunity to increase your Spanish vocabulary, right? I mean, why not? And just to kind of hit home the idea of sophistication in your writing, let's just take, for example, these sentences. So let's just say that you're asked to write something about saving the environment. So let's look at ejemplo uno first. Um, es importante ayudar con el medio ambiente. Debemos ayudar y hacer lo que es correcto. Now, are these sentences grammatically correct? Yeah, absolutely. But if I were an AP reader looking at this, I'm not, but we'll pretend, um, I would notice the lack of complexity in the sentences. They're both very simple, short. There really isn't much to them. They aren't super nuanced. There really isn't a variety of verb tenses being used. And after all, it seems like there's not really a lot of vocab being used. Um, really, there's just a lot that we could add to this. There's a lot missing. So to me, it just seems a little simplistic and a little redundant. So it's not a terrible response. Just given this, this would maybe lead to a three or four just because it's grammatically correct. Um, but we could add a little more to this to bump us up to that five. Instead, let's say, Es importante que tomemos esfuerzos para salvar el medio ambiente para que podamos contribuir a un mundo más seguro y saludable. 
afortunadamente muchas personas ya han hecho esfuerzos para conservar el medio ambiente. Now, hopefully I didn't scare you off or overwhelm you, but um, this is certainly much more advanced, probably more advanced than what you need, but um, we have the present tense, we have the subjunctive, we have the infinitive, we have the present perfect tense, We also have afortunadamente, which is a fantastic linking word between the two sentences. We also have some complex verbs like conservar and contribuir and um, uh, esfuerzos. I, I think that would count as a complex vocabulary term. So um, overall, I feel like that this one is a lot stronger and will earn you more points on the exam. So again, just try to expand on your ideas and make your explanation super rich in vocab, verb tenses, and detail. So in this case, Honestly, the more the better. One final note that I would like to mention is that whenever possible, I would also try to include uh, Spanish idioms in my writing. So um, like phrases that don't literally translate from Spanish to English. So that'll show the AP reader that you also have a cultural understanding of the Spanish language and can do more than just mere translation of basic phrases from English to Spanish because that's what Google Translate is for and we're better than that, right? You are, I promise. So some examples of idioms would be ser pan comido, no importar un pepino o rabano, meter la pata, no tener pies ni cabeza, costar un ojo de la cara. So obviously with these idioms, they all have verbs in them, so um, you'll have to conjugate them depending on who or what you're talking about, but these would be super cool to include in your writing. And these are just some examples of ones that I've used before. So. Um, You can always look up and find ones of your own, um, just as long as they are easy for you to remember um, and broad enough such that you'll be able to incorporate them into your writing. So just make sure that they're broad enough and you'll remember them for when you're actually taking the AP exam. Now those are some general tips for both writing portions of the exam, uh, but now I'm going to briefly discuss each part of the writing specifically. So there an interpersonal writing and a presentational writing. So I'll go over the interpersonal writing first. So interpersonal writing is 15 minutes long. That is, you will have 15 minutes to read the email you have to respond to and write your response. So 15 minutes to read the email and write your response, not a lot of time, but don't fret. Your response really doesn't need to be longer than a page. Really half a page would suffice. That is, if it's super detailed and vocab rich and has different verb tenses throughout and whatnot. The first piece of advice that I would give you for this part of the exam is to make sure that you're reading the email, reading the prompt fully. Read it fully. Be very, very careful that you're not missing anything because oftentimes people will miss it. I know I'm not like an AP reader or a teacher or anything, but I know all the time where people lose points because they're not doing everything the questions asking them to do. Oftentimes in the email, there will be some specific questions that you'll need to respond to in your follow-up email that you're going to be writing. Um, and oftentimes they're kind of scattered throughout the email. So underline, number, star, whatever you need to do, mark up wherever you see, wh wherever they're asking you to do something. So usually there are about two or three of them. So make sure you answer all of them. And just so you're aware, you probably only need like a couple sentences to answer each of those sub-questions. Really, you don't need a whole essay for each one. You don't have that much time. So if you're reading the email for like three or four minutes, you're only having like 10, 11 minutes to write. So really you don't have time to respond to them super in depth. So yeah. The next thing I would note is to make sure that you ask some sort of question in your um, response. Sometimes in the email, they'll tell you to follow up with them and ask them a question back. Other times they won't, but you still should have a question back to whoever you're emailing in your email somewhere. I like to include mine at the end. For example, if the email you're receiving is something about an interview for some company, maybe ask whoever you're um, emailing something about the time, place, like, you know, what would work for him or her in terms of like when the interview is going to happen, like just something like that. But make sure you have like a question in your response somewhere. Also be sure to use the correct heading and closer because the interpersonal writing is formal. So like in English, we would say, dear Mr. Or Mrs. blah, blah, blah. Uh, sincerely insert your name here. Um, for the Spanish email, you'll do something similar. So you'll start with estimado for if you're emailing a male, um, estimada if you're emailing a female. So 
estimado señor blah, 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 estimada señora blah, blah, blah. So estimado would be like dear, whoever. And then at the end, after your email, you're gonna put intentamente. So like sincerely followed by your name. Also, like I said, since it's a formal email, you're going to be using usted, not tu. So yeah, if you're a little too used to addressing your Spanish teacher by two, or you don't use usted very much for whatever reason, you'll want to get in the habit of doing that because that's probably the number one mistake on the interpersonal writing. Yeah, because I think almost always, if not always, it's going to be a formal email, so you're going to want to use usted, so entienden? Okay. So now for the presentational writing, you will be given 15 minutes to read and listen to the sources provided to you and then you'll have 40 minutes of actual writing time. Um, so for this part of the exam, you'll need an intro, two to three body paragraphs, and a conclusion. So just like most essays you've probably written in your English class before. So the only difference is it's well, obviously in Spanish and the conclusion really only needs to be like a sentence or two, honestly. So don't worry if you're running out of time, like you're on that last body paragraph trying to rush to get that conclusion in. You honestly don't really need one. I doubt you'll lose any points for not having one. You, It's really just to bring everything back together um, and restate your thesis, but yeah. Now for this part of the exam, make sure to use information from all three sources um, that they give you and analyze each one in depth. And I guess I should have said this sooner, but uh, you get one like passage, like it's a text-based passage. Um, one that's like some like graph or table, something with numbers basically, data and um, one audio-based passage. And you, I mean, it's kind of expected that you'll use all three. Um, there's really no reason not to, so I would just use all of them. Um, really for each body paragraph, um, at least my teacher anyway, said to use two to three sources per paragraph and just kind of compare and contrast them, like find some similarities and differences between them, between the sources and pull out some good evidence that supports your claim um, again, your claim should be in your intro and just as you're working through your body paragraphs, just try to find some evidence from the sources that kind of supports your claim. Uh, and yeah, really it's kind of like if you're, fam if you're familiar with um, ICE cycles, introduction, citation, explanation, that's basically what that is. You're just doing it multiple times throughout your paper. So, and if you do want to get really fancy and impress your AP reader, you could pull out evidence from the sources that doesn't support your, um, thesis or argument or whatever claim um and kind of have a counter argument or like contradict like contradiction point in your um presentational writing but you definitely don't need that i think that'd be pretty impressive to your ap reader if you could do that especially in spanish but um yeah you definitely don't need one so that's kind of my advice for this part of the exam so here's kind of the condensed version of um the things to remember for the writing in general the interpersonal writing and the presentational writing. So if you need to pause the video and or take a screenshot, you can feel free to do that now. So next I will go over the speaking portion of the exam. So in general, really the best way to prepare for the speaking portion of the exam is, gasp, shockingly enough, to practice speaking. So in Spanish, I should say. I know, thanks so much for the help, Zach. Yeah, you're welcome. So now let's move on to the listening. No, okay, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. So I have more, I promise. So. Anyway, um, I would definitely use um, College Board's past prompts to um, help you prepare for the speaking portion of the exam, just so you know what to expect come exam day. I believe there are also um, uh, student samples um, on the College Board website, so like student samples, like this student earned a five, and you can hear his or her response. Um, I mean, they also have like poor examples, but I don't know why you'd want to listen to those ones. Like, I would listen to the high scoring samples and um, I can provide a link to that in the description if you would like. Um, so yeah, I can do that. So like the writing, the speaking is also divided into an interpersonal and presentational component. So for the interpersonal speaking, you will be asked a set of five questions. And for each of those questions, you'll have 20 seconds to respond. Um, so it can be a little daunting at first because you really aren't after hearing the questions, you really aren't given much time to prepare your responses. Although, before the audio starts, you will be given some background information, like in regards to who you're going to be talking to, um, whether it's like a friend or it's like um, someone who's going to be interviewing you. And when you hear that kind of information, you're going to 
be able to uh, be able to decide whether to use two or who stayed. If it's like a friend, it's more informal. You can use two. If not, then you'll want to use who stayed. Um, you'll also be given kind of information ahead of time on uh, in regards to like what the occasion is and why you're talking to this person. You'll also hear after you hear like you get all the background information. Um, You'll hear all the prompts via audio. Um, they won't be written down for you, so it kind of sucks, but, and you'll only hear them once. You'll only hear like, once they ask you the question, it's just, you'll hear a beep and you have to start talking. So you won't really have any time to think over your responses. So um, really, yeah, you only hear them once, so you wanna make sure you're listening carefully. Um, the thing that is probably most challenging about the interpersonal speaking is just not knowing what to say and just freezing. Like, after hearing the question, you're just like, uh, uh, like, you don't know what to say. Um, I think that's probably the, the trickiest thing about this portion of the exam, um, since you're giving spontaneous responses. But what I would advise you to do is, well, above all things, to say something. Say something. You might freeze a little bit at first, but say something. Like, if you don't say anything at all, I mean, you're guaranteed to not earn any points if you don't say anything at all. Even if what you say sounds atrocious, you're gonna get more points saying something than saying nothing at all. So, after all, it is much better to get in three or four sentences using the whole 20 seconds than to say a couple words in the entire 20 seconds or nothing. Like. Um, just try to get in as much as you can um, because 20 seconds is not a lot of time. So that being said though, it is completely, I repeat, completely okay if you get cut off by the beep because after, after the 20 seconds are done, you'll hear a beep and you have to stop talking. If anything though, you want the sound to cut you off. It's better to use the whole 20 seconds than to end 10 seconds early. Um, speak as much as you possibly can, trust me, use the whole time. When I took the exam that happened to me all five times for all five questions, I was cut off by the timer, so, and I still got a five. So you're not gonna lose any points for it, and if that happens, that's more than okay. I promise you, you will not lose points. Um, also, just like with the writing, make sure to include a variety of verb tenses. So I think for me anyway, some of the easiest ones to include um, are like the gerund, present perfect, the future tense, and conditional. Obviously you can include subjunctive too, um, but just those ones that I mentioned earlier are probably the easiest ones to conjugate if you struggle with verb conjugation on the spot. So just try to do like conditional or present perfect. I think those are probably the easiest ones to just conjugate pretty like quickly. So um, yeah, I always find an excuse to use a variety of verb tenses, even if I wouldn't normally say whatever I'm saying like that normally, I just try to include as many as I can whenever possible. So I would often say something like, as seen in ejemplo uno, me encantaría hablar más con usted si es posible. Um, I would love to talk with you more if possible. Um, I cannot tell, tell you how many times I have used me encantaría or me gustaría. Um, it's just a very easy way to include the conditional tense into your speaking. Um, I guess I didn't think to put this in here, but you could also say like, quisiera. Technically that's imperfect subjunctive, but that means like, I would like something. Um, that's a nice way to do it too. Um, as seen in ejemplo dos, an easy way to include the future tense would be like, le daré una respuesta lo antes posible. Like, I will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I guess that's some variation of that. Um, you could also say, um, Estoy emocionado de usar las destrezas que he adquirido en el pasado para, para ayudar a esta empresa a florecer. I am excited to use my skills that I have acquired in the past to help this company flourish. So that's specifically something I remember saying um, during one of my speakings. I don't know if it was for the real exam or not. I don't think it was, but um, it was something about an interview and I remember using something along the lines of this phrase a lot. So just um, kind of finding ways, uh, clever ways to incorporate a variety of uh, different verb tenses is kind of key for this uh, speaking part of the exam. Again, your speaking may not be perfect. I know mine certainly isn't, even in English, <laughs> but um, so it's okay to make mistakes. It will happen, um, but you just got to keep moving. You've got to try to say as much as you can within each 20 second interval. Um, but again, the best way to get better is to practice. Um, 
Actually, I know, hold on. Okay. Okay. Ow, shoot, that hurt. Okay. Just uh, sliced my foot. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, so I know that Princeton Review Book, this is the 2019 edition. I mean, you're welcome to get like the most recent edition, but uh, this will be your friend. I used this to help study for the exam. It has, um, it comes with like audio CDs. I mean, I like took them out already. I mean, but like it comes with like three or actually, I don't know how many. Um, it comes with some CDs. Um, so you could practice speaking and like he hearing the interpersonal speaking prompts. Um, and it's a fantastic resource. Totally recommend, totally recommend. Um, very helpful. So there are several full length practice exams in here, not just listening, but for all parts. So I found that super helpful and I would definitely take advantage of that. So now for the presentational speaking, you will be given um, the prompt on paper, which is nice. And you'll have uh, four minutes to prepare your cultural presentation and two minutes to actually give your cultural presentation. So um, this part of the exam requires you to um, compare and contrast some tradition or custom or idea between um, your community or home country and um, a Spanish-speaking country. And that Spanish-speaking community could be um, Spain, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Guatemala, Peru, really anything. Or it could even be like a community or city within one of those countries as well, really anything. So it's pretty open-ended. Um, I remember when I took the exam, I think I compared just my local community to that of somewhere in Argentina. So, I mean, it's really up to you, whichever you know the most about, like, uh, it's kind of up to you. So, yeah, anyway, so during the four minute planning period, I would definitely plan your very first sentence, um, like your intro to your presentation or something, because at least for me, if I didn't do that, I would often stutter because I, I do that enough anyway, so it'd be even worse if I didn't. So I would stutter, I just wouldn't know where to start. I, you know, but if you have an idea of what you want to say, like the first thing you're going to say, then, you know, right in the beginning, you'll be able to get the ball rolling and just kind of go from there. So at least for me, that really helps. Just having an idea, just having my, like my intro, my intro sentence kind of all fleshed out. So that for me really, really helps. Um, also during this planning time, I would make sure to write down um, how I was planning to transition between when I'm talking about my community and that of a Spanish speaking country. So like I get like some transition sentences or phrases kind of in there as to like how I'm going to do that. For example, let's say I was told to discuss the differences in gastronomy, food uh, between a Spanish speaking country and my own community. So after my planning period, this is what I have written on my paper. And for the record, yes, I did time myself and it was like a couple seconds over four minutes. So um, I think that counts. Um, now, obviously four minutes is not enough time to write out a whole script for your presentation. And honestly, you shouldn't do that anyway because you don't need to. Just have an idea of where you're starting how you plan to wrap everything up, and when you plan to transition between the two communities you're discussing. So some things I would like to point out for my outline are that, as stated previously, I do have my intro completely planned so I know where I'm starting. I have really pretty much that whole sentence started and I can just say that word for word. Um, and um, I would also like to point out that I have subjunctive in my intro, so I have reconozcamos. Um, I always like to have subjunctive or some other um, unique verb tense other than present tense in my intro so that the AP readers kind of like, um, they're going to remember that I used that complex um, gra uh, grammar. You know what I mean? So like I'll use it in my intro and in my conclusion as well. So like uh, at the very end in my conclusion, I also have um, present perfect with los han unido. So um, yeah. I also have subjunctive when I say nos enfoquemos and um, when I'm talking about the uh, United States. And I also have um, when I'm doing my transition from the US to Spain, I have um, a transition phrase, a diferencia de, which is like unlike, so unlike the US, blah, 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 and then I keep going. 
And um, also, as you can see, I shortened a lot of words. I used some fragments. I was not writing in complete sentences when I'm talking about the United States and Spain. Um, a lot of those are just fragments because you don't need to write out your entire script because you don't have the time to do that. So yeah, of course, your outline does not need to be perfect because the AP readers are not going to be grading your outline. They're grading you on your speaking. So your outline does not need to be perfect. It just needs to be helpful to you. So whatever works for you, whatever, or whatever organization method works for you is perfectly fine for this. So if you would like to hear how I would actually give my two minute cultural presentation on this, I will have a link in the description for you. I know this video is probably already going to be super long as is, so I don't want to add another two minutes to this video, as silly as that sounds. Um, but if you want to hear how I'd actually give this um, two minute cultural presentation, I'll put a link to that in the description if you're interested. So then here's just a rundown on the main points to know for the speaking portion of the exam in general, for the interpersonal speaking, and for the presentational speaking. So feel free to take a screenshot or pause the video um, if that would help you. So now for the listening portion of the exam, um, really the listening and the reading, um, they're a lot more straightforward than the writing and speaking, so I'm probably not going to spend as much time going over them. Um, but again, I'll start with the listening. So. The listening is multiple choice. It is 35 questions you'll have to answer in 55 minutes. Um, the reason why you're kind of given so much time is because some of that time is used to, uh, is spent playing the audios. And the nice thing about um, this part of the exam is that all audios are played two times instead of one time for the uh, interpersonal speaking. So it's, it's kind of nice you get to hear all the audios twice. Um, and yeah, so yeah, 35 questions and there are five sets of questions. So it's like an average of seven questions per set. I don't know if it's exactly seven questions per set. Some might have more, some might have less. I'm not sure, but I know there are five sets of questions and three sets are just audio based and two sets are um, audio and text based. So like it's an audio paired with another text. So obviously the three sets that are just based on audio are a little bit more straightforward with the um ones that are like text and audio like both of them um some of the questions will per uh, will pertain just to the audio some just to the text some to both so what i would say for that some advice for that would be to obviously not mix up the text and audio because if a question is asking about the audio and um like like what what's the main idea of the audio Say there's an answer choice that gives the main idea of the text, you don't want to lose a point just because you either misread the question or mixed them up. So just be careful with that. And then um, make sure you jot notes as you're listening to the audio and jot notes as you're reading the excerpt. Um, and then for the questions that um, ask you about like both, both the text and audio together, make sure you kind of know some commonalities, some similarities and differences between them, because a lot of times you'll have some questions on that. Not all the time, but a lot of the time you will. So, um, and obviously the text and excerpt are going to be related in some way, but um, they might have different perspectives on the same issue, or they might um, be, I mean, they're going to be connected in some way. So you're going to have to probably point out some sort of like, uh, connection between them in one of the questions um, but yeah with the um, like strictly audio and I guess even with the ones that are paired with text um, before listening to the audio definitely 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 preview the questions before the audio starts I think I'm not sure if I don't know I don't know offhand but uh, they might tell you to do this anyway um, on the actual audio but yeah you'll definitely want to preview the questions so that you know what to listen for and then also as you're previewing the questions um, underline the key parts and like what's asking you to do and if you have time maybe write down a keyword or two for each question that you're going to be listening for so you know kind of when to kind of um, look for the right answers and try to listen for those um, so yeah just jot down some keywords as you're listening so obviously, listen carefully and um, scribble down some notes as you go. After the first time the audio is played, um, answer the questions if you haven't already. Like answer the questions that you're confident in. Um, and then the second time the audio is played, what I would recommend doing is just try to listen specifically for the answers to the questions that you struggled with the first time around. By already having answered the questions you were confident the first time around, 
Um, you are then allowing yourself to um, only worry about the one or two questions that you struggled with that, that time. So you'd be increasing your chances of kind of getting those questions you struggled with right if you're only focusing on one or two of them as opposed to all of them again, if that makes sense. If you can't figure out the questions the second time around either, don't worry, just go with your intuition. I know that sounds super obvious, but it's true. Your intuition, your gut's kind of your best bet. Um, oftentimes though, the vaguest or the most general answer is often correct. There have been times where I've been able to eliminate one or two choices and I'm still stuck between the other two or three. Uh, more often than not, the one that's most broad and or the one that pertains to the main idea of the uh, listening is the one that's correct. So when in doubt, go with your intuition. If you're really unsure, then just go with the broadest one or guess if you really need to. Um, but yeah, on any multiple choice, um, if I'm unsure of an answer, I will look at the answers and ask myself, okay, if I select this answer and by happenstance, it's wrong would I still be able to justify choosing this answer? Like if I, like if I, if asked to explain myself, would I be able to provide an explanation or reasoning as to why this answer is correct? It sounds stupid, but believe me, it helps me whenever I am unsure of the answer to a question or if I'm doubting myself. Um, so if you can justify your answer, then there's a good chance it's right. Um, it's probably a safe bet. Um, if you're really unsure, again, just guess. You won't be penalized for guessing, and really, you should answer every question even if you don't know the answer. Um, you're not penalized, so I would put down an answer. Um, but again, the best way to practice and prepare for the listening is to um, constantly be exposed to hearing spoken Spanish. Again, we'll bring this up again. Princeton Review Book. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I use this a lot and it came with, again, it came with some CDs with practice listening exercises as well. So um, again, I would totally recommend that. Also, if you check out College Board's past listening exercises from prior exams, um, I think that would be very helpful if that is of interest to you. Again, link in the descriptions. So here are just the things that I would keep in mind for the listening portion of the exam. So really, if you need to, you can pause the video now and uh, take a screenshot or just Take a moment to look over those if you want. And finally, there is the reading portion of the exam. Um, as you can probably assume, the reading is a compilation of print texts. Some are fictional pieces, some are poems, um, advertisements, visual aids, announcements. It, the list goes on. But um, for this section, you will have to answer 30 multiple choice questions in 40 minutes. Um, so the time, the time crunch is kind of there. It's not as tight as the SAT or ACT um, since this AP exam is not really necessarily meant for uh, native speakers. Certainly there are native speakers that take this exam, but um, I think AP readers understand that not everyone who's taking it is uh, going to be a native Spanish speaker. So you do kind of have some wiggle room, but you do kind of have to keep moving at a steady pace. Um, so some things to keep in mind for this portion of the exam is to use context clues. Um, there will be some questions that will ask you some vocabulary and context or some phrases and context. They may be idiom idiomatic phrases, so if you know your idioms, you might be in luck here. You might get lucky and just happen to know them. Um, otherwise, you can use your context clues. Because I will tell you now, even if you are a native speaker, you probably will not know every single word. I mean, if you're a native speaker, Maybe, but probably not. Um, and if you're not a native speaker, you definitely will not know every single word. I promise you, just like in English, when I'm reading classical English literature, I, I say that like I do it all the time, but I really don't. Um, when I'm reading like some like old text in English, I'm not gonna understand every single word and I'm gonna have to try to piece things together. Same thing here. But anyway, my point is don't get so bogged down on one or two words if you don't know what they mean. So um, it's gonna happen, it's bound to happen. But um, what I would say, make sure you know context clues, um, know the main idea, be able to kind of piece that together. Um, jot notes in the margins if that's something that works for you. If not, you don't need to do that. But um, um, I would say for me, I do like a note, a paragraph. Like and when I say a note, I mean like five to six words. You don't wanna be writing a whole separate excerpt, a whole separate novel when you're supposed to be analyzing the actual excerpt, not writing one of your own. Um, I would say like a note per paragraph, maybe two if it's a long paragraph, but um, 
yeah. Again, let's see. Identifying point of view of the author that might be there. Um, identifying the purpose, audience. I said main idea already, didn't I? But um, again, so pace yourself um, and don't spend too much time on one passage. Especially for me, I tend to be a very, very slow reader. So um, be sure not to get bogged down on the passage. You can probably get away with skimming parts of it, but I try to read as much of it as you can because um, you have the time to. It's not like the ACT where you have to skim the passage. Like You can get away with reading the whole thing. You have the time. But yeah, same thing for when you come across a question you're unsure of, just use process of elimination. Um, eliminate the obviously wrong answer or answers and just try to reason between the two or three that are left if you're really stuck on a question. Um, again, if you have to guess, guess. That's totally fine. You do not lose points for guessing. Um, you do not lose points for wrong answers. You only gain points for correct answers. And this is true for all AP exams, so there's no penalty for guessing. So really there's no reason why any bubble should be left blank. The least you can do is at least answer every question. Just give yourself the best possibility of scoring well on the exam. The nice thing is though, that pretty much all of the questions to each reading are in order, like chronologically, uh, like in the passage. So you can and should answer the questions in order. And if it helps you as well, you could skim them before and or after you read the passage. I personally don't do that just cause I you usually tend to spend more time like reading the passage, but I know that works for a lot of um, a lot of people I know. So if that works for you, go for it. Um, also, this might sound super strange, but don't like if you have outside knowledge of whatever the topic of the reading is, um, don't let that past knowledge uh, like cause you to get a question wrong. And I'll explain what I mean. Like if there is a question on something on the passage. And one of the answer choices gives you something that's true, but it's beyond the scope of the reading. You might be tempted to choose that answer if you have outside knowledge of whatever the topic is, but it's not going to be the right answer. Even if it's true, if it's not in the reading, then there really isn't any like basis in the text that would lead you to choose that answer, if that makes sense. So make sure not to choose answers that are not in the reading, that are not in the, within the scope of the reading. Um, also, be sure to read for the general meaning, the general meaning of the passage. This goes again with uh, not getting too bogged down on one passage. Just keep moving and just try to get the general meaning, not um, every little detail. Um, and yeah, again, like the listening, most of the time, the most general answers are going to be correct, unless the question is specifically asking about like the meaning of something in context or like um, what. I don't know, yeah, just like what a vocabulary term means or an idiom. Um, so yeah, unless it's something like that, I would go with typically the most uh, general answer, so long as it's covered within the text. Also, just be careful that um, you're avoiding answers that are misconstrued. A lot of times, um, students have a tendency to choose answers that sound correct just because the terms used in the answer choice uh, they remember hearing those, like, or reading those in the passage. Oftentimes, they kind of misconstrue it so that it's not true, but, like, the same terms are being used, if that makes sense. Um, oftentimes, the correct answer won't have the exact terms from the reading. They'll have, like, synonyms of the words. So even if you remember hearing certain um, words in the passage and you see that in, in, an, in an answer choice, and you're like, oh, that must be right, because that sounds the most right. Just make sure you're reading carefully um, and you make like a valid judgment before selecting your answer. But yeah, really that's kind of just my advice for the reading section. So here is kind of my little cheat sheet of things to remember for the reading section of the exam. So again, feel free to pause the video or take a screenshot if you need some time to look over this. So now that we've gone over kind of what to know for the exam and the structure of the exam, um, I'm just going to kind of go over some odds and ends, just some final things to keep in mind, uh, just some general things for the exam. So the first thing I want to go over is false cognates. So for example, injuria does not mean injury, it means insult. So it's not really like a uh, physical injury, that would be herida, um, it's more like um, 
guess, psychological, if you will. Um, soportar does not mean to support. That would be apoyar. Um, it means to endure or have to deal with something. And then uh, realizar means um, to fulfill, not to realize. If you want to say to realize, you would say like, um, darse cuenta de. Obviously, you'd have to conjugate that. Um, and then libreria uh, is not library. That would be biblioteca, right? Uh, libreria is bookstore. And then uh, sensitivo. It's not sensitive, but it's sensory. Remember, if you wanted to say sensitive, that would be sensible. So that one's kind of a tricky one too. It's not sensible. It's they're kind of backwards. Um, and then the last one we have is um, experimentar, um, which is not to experiment. It is to experience more often than not. I suppose if you were to conduct like a scientific experiment, you could say experimentar, but I put this one here because more often than not, when you hear or see uh, experimentar being used, it's more often like to undergo or to experience something. If you wanted to say to try or to experiment with something, it's not like a scientific experiment, you could also say um, probar, like to try something new, like a food or something. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why I include this one in here as well. The next thing I would say is to, if you haven't uh, figured that out by now, is to know all the verb tenses. And yes, I mean all of them. Even in perfect subjunctive, plusquam perfecto, there's some pretty nasty ones, but um, preterite, I guess, is pretty nasty in and of, in and of itself. But um, yeah, I mean, you'll want to know all the verb tenses um, and the correct conjugations for each one. At least, if you can't conjugate them for the like fast enough for the speaking, the least you can do is at least recognize them when they're in the passages or when you're hearing them like at least be able to recognize them because i know a lot of people in my class um got confused with um what was it in between the imperfect and the conditional tense because they both end in ia at least for er and ir verbs um again the difference would be like versus comia and comeria which comia is imperfect comeria is conditional again for conditional you would keep the uh, infinitive stem there like the er that stays so that's really the difference um and again like because if you can't recognize that difference you wouldn't know if a passage is saying they were living versus they would live and those are very different so make sure you're able to recognize the verb tenses at the very least if you can't conjugate fast enough for the speaking so um yeah it's important to know the difference also make sure <laughs> Make sure to match gender and number. You'd be surprised how many times I hear I hear in um in the speaking presentations and myself included. I do make mistakes as well, um, like especially with some that are irregular, like el dia, la mano, el tema, el idioma, like the mas are masculine and the dads are feminine. If you've heard that before, like the ciudad, la ciudad. Anyway, so make sure you match gender and number. Um, and I guess the one thing that I heard oh, mistakes all the time, all the time in pronunciation, especially for speaking, this is important. So here we have a list of five words and really these words are not difficult, but um, there are, these are kind of some examples of um, some mistakes I often hear. So as uh, English speakers, we tend to Americanize the pronunciation of words that look similar to words we already know in English. So when we look at um, the first one, um, información, um, even at an AP level, you'd be surprised how many times I'll hear something like information, like it's like information, with a hint of Spanish at the end. So it's not información or any variation of that, it's información. Same thing with um, the next one, it's huella, huella, not wella, not huella. Remember, double L's make a Y sound, J's make an H sound, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, please don't do, please don't say huella. Um, and then the next one, you might look at it and think, like, how do I mispronounce it? Well, just pay attention to where the accent is. I would say, more often than not, I'll hear people say, arboles instead of arboles. 
Then with the next one, again, we have a double R, so we'll have to roll it. I know I can't roll mine very well, so. But with this one, again, we have a double L, that becomes a Y, so it's desarrollar. Sorry, I can't roll my, L, uh, my R's very well, but it'd be something like that. Um, and then the last one, again, it's triangle, but we tend to Americanize the pronunciation. Um, it's actually pronounced triangulo, not triangulo. Um, just be aware of that as you are looking at these words. And then there's ser versus a star. That's still a thing. And preterite versus imperfect. Um, basic grammatical concepts like por versus para. Um, distinguishing between the prepositions. Um, knowing when to use the subjunctive versus the indicative. Um, and when to use the infinitive. So um, stuff like that. Um, just kind of to keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. Um, again, read the passages carefully questions, read them carefully, listen to the prompts carefully, a lot of things to keep in mind, I know. Um, practice, 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 especially with speaking, that's the hardest skill to master. Um, again, another tip, use Princeton Review, get the book if you want to, um, uh, and then look at the past FRQs, look at College Board's uh, site, and then really my last thing is just to Take a deep breath and relax. It will be okay. You will do great. I know I was super nervous for the AP exam too. It's completely natural to be nervous, but remember just to take a, take a deep breath, take a breather, uh, it will be okay. Um, I believe in you. I know that coveted five, it is all yours for the taking. So let me know in the comments um, if you have any questions for me. Um, I am definitely more than happy and more than available to help you if you have any questions. I'm not a native speaker by any means, I am not a teacher by any means, I am just a student who is willing to help in any way that I can. So if you have any questions, please let me know, and um, I will help as best as I can. So let me know in the comments if you have any questions. But you got this. Hopefully this video was helpful. If so, you can leave a like and or comment. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you guys later. So take care, everyone.